are these new cities filled with sensors and computers really ideal cities as their designers would have one believe? Are they really modern utopias that are becoming a reality? When you think about smart cities and you ask yourself, well, what's the biggest risk on paper or on the screen? They look like they have thought through everything. That everything can be controlled, often by a firm. So if you make all these buildings pregnant with technical systems that run everything, and you think that the rate of obsolescence of those systems is very different from the stones with which that building was made, then you have a problem. One of the risks is that our cities are becoming like computers in open air. Our cars are becoming like computers on wheel. Well, we all know what happens when our computer gets a virus and crashes. But what if your city or your car gets a virus and crashes? Of course, these are vulnerable places, so they are potential points of attack for soldiers, for terrorists, or for strictly financial purposes in a context of criminal behavior and theft. It's obvious. It's going to happen. There's always going to be the so-called non-state sponsored terrorists, right? The, the hackers who are going to come in and you'll get... It, it is, it is a, it's going to be the rule of the, the future. I don't think you'll ever get to a stage where it'll be, there will be no, no bugs, that there will be no uh, errors. But I think the fail-safe systems will come into play that says, uh, you know, we'll detect it and we'll interpret it. So we have to build redundancies, we have to build the securities, and it is a top priority not only for Cisco, but for IBMs of the world and for cities and governments. For tech companies, the city is often reduced to a series of problems that are just waiting to be resolved through their software and their networks. They are fighting over the very lucrative market that is smart cities and think of these new cities as technological showrooms. It's a business. Right now we have a business of making cities. And these businesses are increasingly interested in selling you whole cities. That they then keep the kindly way of putting it is servicing. That's then an ongoing source of revenue. There is money to be made, but the monetization of big data is not very clear. Lots, the, of, money. lots of money to be made. If you, in fact, Lots of money. What I'm saying is that the target that I gave the company in 2017, I'm going to cover at the end of this year. The market uh, for smart cities, it's at least $400 billion. So it's a huge market. I think uh, when you consider just the population growth, when you consider the migration of people from rural areas to, you know, just in India and China alone, 800 million people will move in the next 20 years, 800 million. And all of these cities have to be built quickly. They don't have the time span of 100 years to build a London or 100 years to build a Philadelphia. You have to do it in 8, 10 years. And to do it in 8, 10 years, you better think in terms of replicable models. But that doesn't mean all cities will look the same. But the principles should be similar. The whole idea that Stan has is how do you build a city in a box so that you can scale and replicable very quickly. So he's taken all his ideas and he put it into a concept idea, and then he sold that. But now, uh, we've had visitors from over 50 cities, many from China, from India, and around the world. And I had to stop the visitors from coming. We couldn't get any work done here. <laughs> we had a mayor a week coming in. Of course, there's preparation, sign up, and sign MOU to share ideas, which we did with the city. But I had, you know, 200-person staff over there, and then half of them were out giving tours. We have already exported the city model to Ecuador three years ago. Other countries, like Yemen and Vietnam, are also interested in importing it. And we're currently in negotiations. Both the South Koreans and the Americans expressed their willingness to export their green city kit model. 
and the Chinese municipalities appear very interested. Near Shangsha, where Mao grew up, the new city of Meishi Lake is emerging, directly inspired by Songdo. But this center for business is five times the size, and it won't be home to 65,000 inhabitants, but to 500,000. As in South Korea, the master plan was designed by the New York-based Gale and KPF. Our work at the Meishi Lake was learning from this new Songdo city example and took a leap quite a bit further in terms of environmental planning, landscape planning, transport, et cetera. There is a lake that ironically had been drained by Mao Zedong in order to create farmland. Now we're making it back into a lake again. But part of the reason for that is there's tremendous flooding in, in this area every year, which is uh, really, really damaging. And the kind of water remediating reservoir created by this lake is of great, great benefit. But then the lake, is as a kind of water transport uh, center, a kind of a transport ground where ferries and boats can crisscross from point A to point B to point C across the lake. Everybody should be able to go to work by water taxi. We're working now in 25 major cities in China, and I can see the importance of, of this exercise in Meishi Lake is tremendous. New cities could indeed serve as a model to respond to the ecological crisis and the explosion of the urban population in some countries like China. But what is the impact of these experimental, ultra-connected cities on the way of life of the city dwellers? I sometimes think we are too dependent on machines. But life has become a little simpler. All these little details like using the same pass to get out of the parking lot, to enter your house, to use the equipment downstairs in the fitness center, to play golf, to use the sauna or the library, everything. When you use this pass, all the data is recorded. What I did, the service I used, everything is recorded. And you can see it all here. That's a surveillance camera screen. Even in the evenings, thanks to the street lighting, we can see the children playing. And we can see all the play areas in the residence. In Songdo, security is a real obsession. The inhabitants watch, and they are watched, constantly. Thousands of cameras watch the city and its inhabitants 24-7. Of course, the drawback is that I'm constantly being filmed. But because I have children, their private lives aren't very... Uh, of course, their private life is important, but their safety is more important than their private lives, I think. I think the feeling of being protected is more powerful than that of being watched. Everything is recorded, who went out and when. So it's impossible to be unfaithful. <laughs> Cameras will soon become intelligent. We already have cameras that we call shot putter that can detect a sound and say that sound is a rifle or a gun or it's a shotgun or it's a bomb or it's just a car backfiring. So based on that, the moment it assumes it's not a car that is backfiring, all the cameras will zoom to where the sound is and then that image and the picture will go to the appropriate security places uh, in a very timely manner. The new cities are a dream for some, but for others, they are an Orwellian nightmare, with Big Brother threatening the private lives of citizens and their individual freedoms. China is constructing dozens of new cities and is starting to create huge control centers like the one in Songdo. There are a huge number of surveillance cameras on every intersection and every section of road. It's the government who wanted and who designed that. 
Such a big control system has a large amount of data, of raw data. We have to transfer all the data gathered here to our data center. Then in the future we can manage it and keep it safe. This data will provide the base for smart systems. That's why we need to ensure maximum security for it. Some personal data has leaked in the past, so the right to access images has become very strictly controlled. Only authorized people can access it. Moreover, every time someone accesses it, it is recorded and archived in real time. So everything is done to prevent as much as possible any illegal or undesired personal data leaks. In the end, I think the system is good and bad, depending on who is using it. Almost any technology can be misused. There's always a danger that the camera that is there to protect the, 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 the lives of citizens, the camera that you put on the highways for monitoring traffic management, the cameras that you're putting in at, at, at toll booths, can also, that same data can be used for monitoring whether you're going here, you're going there, and a government can spy on you the government can use your data for controlling you if you're going against the government. Then the question really is, you know, to whom is that government accountable? So we are, when we enter the zone of very powerful systems, we immediately enter the zone of their governance. You see, and, and then, you know, a powerful government can be truly a destructive force. We know that. And with enormous amount of legitimacy, whereas a firm can be exposed as breaking the law. It's very difficult to expose a government as breaking the law. Governments are breaking the law continuously in the name of our security. I wouldn't say that big data is big brother, as others say, but I would say that we need to be very careful about how we use the data and you know, who has access to it and how we can use it for the public good and not for the good of just few. You can think about systems where you know people have control of their own data and they can make decisions about when they want to share it, and to whom, with whom, they want to share it. Can new cities, which are constructed around an information system, become anything other than experiments or technological showrooms? Can they resist the test of time and one day become real cities, vibrant and diverse? I think one thing the Songdo is lacking is, uh, is looking natural. If you see the buildings here and everything is just so well planned and so like structured, so it, it's like a lacking some kind of spontaneous creativities. So I hope that you know, in some future Songdo will encourage this uh, like organic growth or some kind of spontaneous creativity environment. One very common image that we have of these intelligent cities is that uh, they're sanitized, everything is perfect. That's a collection of perfectly uh, standing buildings. That is not cityness. What is lacking is disorder, the unforeseen, friction and differences. What gives cities their spice? I think that Fairly quickly, we will have the overwhelming feedback that these cities are, well, pretty fucking boring. I think that will be the key to transforming new cities into real cities or into deserts. These are cities for well-off people with no financial problems. They are extremely homogenous, and the consequence of such homogeneity is they will have to be closed off. They will need to be protected from everyone else, not just because they are dangerous, bad people, but because by definition the others, those outside, have not come to this place with the same mindset, the same desires and the same culture. Therefore, they will upset the lovely order of the place. They'll come with their big cars, while everyone is meant to be driving a hybrid. The majority of these cities, almost all of them, are enclaves. In China, near Shangsha, one mega-rich businessman is pushing the enclave idea even further. He is planning to construct a city in a tower. He is fond of all things grandiose, having already constructed an Egyptian pyramid on his company premises and a French-style chateau with a ballroom copied from that at Versailles. Now he wants to construct the highest tower in the world, called Sky City, 
838 meters high with 220 floors, a city tower where some 300,000 people could live and work. It would have more than 4,000 apartments, more than 200 hotel rooms, over 100,000 square meters of medical and educational structures, more than 10,000 square meters of interior gardens. Its main benefit is that it will save a great deal of space. We are reducing the urban space per inhabitant by 100 times. Secondly, in terms of daily life and work in this building, we hope the elevators will totally resolve the problem of traffic jams. We hope to be able to create them in China, India and other developing countries to offer a better living environment. In July 2013, the first stone of Sky City was officially laid. But a short time afterwards, construction was stopped. A lot of people were concerned about the solidity of this city tower, where urban dwellers would live like human termites. Some futuristic cities will remain a virgin territory. However, many others have yet to be invented. <laughs>